All right, good morning. Welcome, good to see everyone here this morning. If you had a great week, sunshine, it's good to see everyone here together, and uh, it's a good day. So welcome, glad you're here. It's been a, you know, a busy week for everyone, I'm sure. It's nice to get some nice weather. Uh, yesterday was a pretty hot and warm day, you know, and of course yesterday my, uh, my brother decided, you know, we should do some firewood yesterday. So uh, we have a whole bunch of trees that we cut down from um, the side piece of ground that we had, and so uh, uh, my brother was helping his wife's grandpa, you know, get some of this wood and cut it and split it and load it into the trailer, and uh, we did about three loads of that, and that was a little bit warm. We got that taken care of. Then we took the boys out to my my aunt's. She has a, a pool, um, and they, they were swimming, so that was kind of that was kind of fun for them to kind of enjoy that a little bit. But it was it was nice. Enjoy some nice weather. Um, oh, we I'm trying to think of what else is going on. Just uh, I'm getting ready for the new baby. That's kind of a new thing too. Trying to make sure because it could be probably any, you know, any day now. Really, you never know what uh, when that's going to go on. So just to continue to keep training the baby in prayer that they feel you know are good and everything like that. So uh, what else is going on? Oh, I um, this week for whatever reason I decided. You know, we have these, um, oh, what is it, like the Whirlpool bathtub. You know, we don't use it a lot, the jets and things. I mean, it's not used very much, but I'm like, you know, I probably should, should clean this, you know. So I uh, did the old YouTube on how to do this, you know, and, <laughs> and they said, you know, you can put like white vinegar in and bleach or dish soap or whatever, you know, run the cycle through. And I decided to put a little bit extra in, you know, and, and so I would not advise that because next you know, like the bubbles are like up to here, almost overflowing. I'm, I'm scooping them up and putting them in the sink. I'm putting them in the toilet just because it's coming over everywhere. And so, yeah, just when they say don't overdo the dish soap, don't overdo the dish soap because uh, it was uh, not a good, uh, a great picture for sure. But it should be clean. You know? Anyways, that was my adventure for the week as far as trying to clean that stuff. But anyways, glad you're here. So this morning we are continuing on. In our journey in the books of the Bible, we are in the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, I'm not going to put Doc on the spot today. He, sometimes he wasn't sure. But 1 Timothy is the book that we are in as we go through. Uh, and we're moving all along. You know, before you know it, we will be all the way at the end. Uh, and again, this has been an overview uh, of the book of the Bible. So 1 Timothy, uh, it's going to be an overview. will be pretty simple, actually. We're going to read a lot of what uh, is in the text. So we'll be extra scripture this week. And I just say this is... Um, number one, you have a better understanding of, of what this book is. Uh, number two, remember, he's writing to a specific person who is uh, addressing specific situations in a specific church, uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not principles that we can apply for our own lives as well. And so it's a pretty straightforward thing. We're just going to read it and see what we can kind of take for um, what is Paul's motivation here and what can we learn for our own lives as well. So as usual, okay, what's this book about? Here we go. The author, of course, the Apostle Paul. He is the author of the book of 1 Timothy, written about 62 to 66 uh, AD. And then what is the reason? Well, Paul is writing to Timothy uh, and encourage him, him, encouraging him as he's having this responsibility for overseeing the work of the church in um, Ephesus, uh, maybe some other churches as well. Uh, but, and, and there's a lot of different topics in here, which we'll cover some of them. But in essence, 1 Timothy is kind of like a, uh, a leadership manual for church organization and administration and things like that. And so keep this in mind as Paul is writing to, to Timothy in this, in this book. You know, as I was reading this week and doing some of my studies and commentaries and things like that, you learn a lot of different topics and things. But keep in mind, so, so Timothy... Uh, was one of Paul's trusted companions, right? He really entrusted Timothy with overseeing churches and handling some problems and things that were arising in different churches. Uh, and so he's going to be encouraging. Now, Timothy, often here, is stepping into a hornet's nest. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, man, what problems I got to deal with now? What problems do I have to address with now? But remember, as a church... Biblically, what is the church? The church is the people of God. It's not a building, right? The word is ecclesia, is the called out ones is what the meaning is. So the people is the church. Biblically, that's what it is. We even see in the book of Acts. What? In the book of Acts, all the people came, about 3,000 were baptized in one day, right? They didn't know each other. They were from all over the place, but they were considered the church. And of course, you have various congregations as well. But we'll talk about more of that in a second. But here, we're going to see that Timothy has a challenging job. He really does. In one of the, uh, the commentaries I was reading, the studies, it says this. I was going to read a quote. Um, it says, uh, you know, what is the most difficult job? He says, if many people would ask, you would have all kind of ideas on what the most difficult job in the world would be, right? And he said, if, if you would ask Paul, 
Paul would say, without a doubt, one of the hardest jobs is the pastor. And we see with Timothy's going on here, he said, he said, actually, the pastor, uh, a pastor must call upon a wide range of skills. And the quote says this, in a given week, a pastor may act as a psychologist, a priest, a social worker, a hospital chaplain, an administrator, personnel supervisor, philosopher, and communicator. Paul's aware of the vital nature of such a job. Churches sprouted up wherever he visited, but whether they survived or failed had to do a lot with the, 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 the person that was in place here, right? With, with Paul, Timothy, he would often rely on Timothy or Silas or some other people that he would send here. And so just keep this in mind, Paul was writing to Timothy, and this church is facing some issues. And we'll talk about some of these things here in, in a second here, because there's a lot of different issues that he's taking on. And so now Paul is going to, to write this. And so, all right, chapter one. Chapter one, and again, this is a brief overview. Um, first, now Paul is going to give a warning against false teachers uh, of the law. And so Paul is going to kind of encourage Timothy to take on people that were teaching false things, engaging in some of the stuff. So go to verse three through seven. He says this. As I urged you when you went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or devote themselves to myths or endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart in a good conscience and sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. And uh, as you see some of this stuff, you know, Paul doesn't really talk about too much what these false teachings were going on. I think it's you know, safe to say there's some people that were teaching, uh, again, that you had to be uh, you know, uh, keeping true to the, the Jewish law and the customs and things like that, plus Jesus. Uh, and, you know, we see that back in Galatians and things like that. But, but nevertheless, I think what really jumps out here is, essentially, is like Paul's like, these people, they're so, number one, they don't know what they're talking about. But number two, they're so obsessed with just meaningless talk and controversial speculations instead of what? Advancing God's work, which is by faith. He says the goal of this command is what? Love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. And so Paul essentially is saying, listen, like, these people, they're just, talking and getting into all this empty talk and arguments and philosophies and speculations and back and forth, and they're missing what the actual point is, right? Which is God's church is to advance the kingdom, and you do it. Why? How? By loving God and loving others. And so I think is while he's addressing this very specific situation, us as a church, as God's people, need to remember that. You know, sometimes we can get very wrapped up into you know, um, theological points of views or theological maybe doctrines that we're wrestling with or questioning and, or, or whatever. And it's good to have those conversations and talk about them and, and things like that. But if some people get so obsessed with them that they actually are missing the whole point, right? They argue about them. They fight about them. They, they're not even doing anything to advance God's kingdom. They're in, engaging in all this stuff, right? And so we are to be on guard against um, what Paul would say in the Bible would say empty and meaningless philosophies and get creep in, right? Uh, but at the same time, he's like, don't spend, it's not about that. Some people make it all about an intellectual thing versus what it actually means to advance God's kingdom. So as the church, keep us in mind, right? Don't let so much of the division occur over arguments about certain points of scripture or theological topics or whatever. I mean, have those conversations and learn and try to grow and understand for sure. But don't let it get so focused where you're not advancing God's kingdom. And the, what the goal of this command is what? Love, which comes from a pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith. He says some have departed from this and turned to meaningless talk. And so we'll just stop there because there's a lot in there because I know some churches, they, they just get so focused on that and arguing and fighting and dividing over a certain, you know, whether it's theological doctrine, whether it's, you know, you know, constitutional legalism or whatever, and but actually, actually focusing on what it means to go and do and help advance God's kingdom and work, right, through love. Now look what, this is a great picture here, the next thing is, is Paul's going to talk about the Lord's grace to him. If you ever wanted to see the heart of Paul and just what his mindset was, this is a great picture here in chapter in uh, verses 12. It says this, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy. 
appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer uh, and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Number one, obviously we see Paul's thing is God's glory is the focus, right? It's not about me, Paul. It's about God's glory be forever. But look at Paul's mindset. He's, he's saying he called himself the worst of sinners. You know, Paul wasn't some, um, you know, nose up in the sky, looking down on people, judgmental person. Now, actually, he says he was. He used to be that way, right? You know, a legalist of a legalist. But now he says, Christ died for me who I am a sinner of sinners. I'm the worst of sinners, he said. That's a great picture of what it looks like to have a, 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 a Christian's attitude or heart. Not going around saying, oh, thank goodness I'm not like that person or I'm like that person. But you say, you know what? I, having my, Paul's mindset, am one of the worst of sinners, you know? I, I, I'm not better than somebody else, you know? I, I, but for the grace of God, there goes I kind of mentality, right? The old saying is, I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where to, where to find bread. And so be very careful when you catch yourself having an attitude where you're looking down upon people, where you think you're some self-righteous, religious, holier-than-thou person. Because Paul did not think of himself that way. Actually, he did until he said he was in ignorance and wrong. Then he repented, right? And now he says, thank God for God's mercy and grace uh, on sinners, whom I the worst, right? And so Paul had this mindset of himself. He recognized he was a sinner. He recognized he needs God's mercy and grace. And he walked and lived like that. Why? So that that great mercy that was shown to him might be shown to others and display, right, uh, to others who might believe. That was what he wanted. He wanted God's mercy to him to be displayed through him to other people so they might come to faith in Christ. And so as we go out of these doors, remember that. Be humble. Realize you're not better than anybody else. That actually without Jesus Christ, we're all in the same boat. Right? It's not based on what we have done, but rather what he has done. And we're called to what? The Bible says, walk humbly, right? Have that mindset. Remember the story of the, 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 the religious elite and the, and the tax collector in the temple, you know? And the religious elite, oh, praise God and put all this money in and, and thank God I'm not like this sinner. And the sinner uh, the, just wouldn't even look to heaven and said, Lord, forgive me and, and put his head, I'm not even worthy to look to you. And the one that was justified was what? The sinner, right? Because he had the, the humble mentality of what it means to follow God. This is a great picture of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to actually follow the steps of Paul, of being a humble-hearted person, you know? Don't go around, because people, we always want to go and look at people and judge them. Why? Because it makes us feel better about ourselves, and people will often do what? You'll pick people who you think are worse than you, therefore you don't feel bad about yourself. Well, I may not be perfect, but at least I'm not like that person, right? That's not what it does, because that, that isn't the goal or benchmark. The, the, the goal or benchmark is God. We are all falling short of the glory of God, the Bible says. And so we need to be humble and remember Paul considered himself a sinner of sinners. And this is a great picture of Paul's mindset here. So don't be self-righteous. It is completely anti-Christian to have that mindset. And then look at what he's going to say to Timothy in verse 18. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them you may fight the battle well, hold on to the faith in a good conscience, which have, some have rejected and have suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. Among them they are Hermineus and Alexander, who have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. And again, he's again battling for his faith, having a good conscience as you walk in your faith. And you are in a battle, right? This world is a battle. There's a battle, there's a spiritual battle going on, good and evil, you know, and there's always whispering in both ears, you know, and the Holy Spirit talking to you, also Satan whispering. And so who are you going to listen to? And then I, it's interesting, it's a side note, he says, some have suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. Uh, we won't get into it, but I find that an interesting topic. I and mean, there's a lot of theological things you could pull from that, but 
But essentially, it seems like some had faith, right? But then they made a shipwreck of their faith. Uh, and so some scholars will take this verse and, and again, draw out the point of, you know, you know, it is possible to, you know, reject or quote-unquote fall away or, or whatever it might be, right? Because, again, how else do you make a shipwreck of something you never had, right? And so apparently they had faith, but they made a shipwreck of it because they had whether rebelled or fallen away or, or whatever it might be. I just point that out because it's an interesting um, uh, phrase that Paul used here. Now chapter 2, uh, there's going to be some instruction on worship. Uh, and so now he's going to be addressing some very kind of uh, specific situations that are going on in this specific church, uh, but it doesn't mean in, in a specific culture, but it doesn't mean that we can't learn some principles from this as well. So go to verse uh, 1, says this, I urge then, first of all, uh, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has been now witnessed at two at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. And again, I just think it's uh, in regards to worship, saying, church, pray for these people, right? Pray for the kings and authorities, making sure you're doing that. Are you being a church and people of prayer? Um, and guess what? The kings and authorities, many times in this culture, were what? They were brutally persecuting Christians, and but they were called to pray for them, right? And so as Christians, are we even praying for our leaders, who you may disagree with wholeheartedly? You know, are you doing that? Praying for them, um, praying that God might speak to them or reach them or touch them in somehow. Uh, again, we're called to what? Pray for our enemies and love those who persecute us and all of that. Uh, and so that's a call right here for Paul. And then he says what? Live quiet and, and, and quiet, peaceful lives, right? In all godliness and holiness. Are we doing that? Are we just trying, you know, don't get too bogged down in what the world is doing. But just say, you know what? I, 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 don't, I can't control what they're going to do, but I can control what I'm going to do, right? Like the old Bible saying is, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord kind of mindset, right? You know, we might... It's easy to get frustrated with what the world is doing and what other people are doing and what Facebook is doing and get sucked into that. But you say, you know what? Okay, they're going to do that. Um, but as for me and my household, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to live a peaceful life, a, a, a faithful, a, a, a godly life, right? That kind of mindset. And then I love what it says too. Is Again, another little phrase that jumps out. And he says what? Um, that, that he desires... Um, God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Another interesting phrase, you know, like, uh, he, he wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But we know from the Bible, right, all are not saved because some people will um, re reject that. And I always thought that that phrase, too, kind of combated a little bit this idea of, like, you know, maybe Calvinism, predestination or whatever, right? That says that everyone's already appointed to be saved from the beginning of time and you can't reject it. But I wasn't sure, how does that work out? If he wants all to be saved, he desires that, but we know not all are saved, how does that work out, right? Just an interesting thing to pull out. I'm not going to get into that topic, but just know that is one phrase that kind of jumps out if you're into that topic or, or conversation at all in, in terms of that. But, but nevertheless, we see this going on here. Uh, and now go to verse 8. Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Now, this is one of those verses, too, where people in history have taken out of time and saying, like, women, okay, you know, no jewelry, no fancy hairdos, none of that, and so you're all sinners. No, of course not. No, that's not what he's talking about here. People misunderstand. Remember, he's writing to a certain, um, he's writing Timothy, who is dealing with a certain church in a certain time. So in this time, there were things that would be considered 
it's cultural, immodest or distracting or whatever it might be. Um, also during this call time and culture, many pe- women who were um, promiscuous or would, would engage in certain kind of um, decorations or whatever it might be you want to call it. Uh, and, and Paul essentially is saying, listen, if you would do that in this culture, in worship, you're causing a big distraction, right? Like here, it's not distracting anybody. It's not, no, it's not getting anyone worked up, whatever. It's a, it's a cultural thing. And so Paul was dealing with an issue again that is happening in a church in a time where uh, he doesn't want women to be doing things that are distracting from the worship service. Now, while that's not the case here and now in our culture and time, that would have been the case in this. And that's true here. We wouldn't want whatever it might be um, in considered distracting or, or whatever in our time or culture to be pulling away from the worship service, right? And so many people, though, take this to be like a once and all legalistic kind of thing without understanding the context in which it was written. I will, I'll read this too. I, wasn't gonna, I didn't put it up there, but I'll read this because this is, we'll touch on it very quickly. But this is sometimes taken out of context as well. In verse 11, he says, A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Uh, For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who deceived and became a sinner. And some people, again, are like, what is this about? This doesn't sound very, you know, good. What is that? Why does it seem to be very um, uh, against women or whatever? And again, remember, um, he's addressing a certain situation. We don't have time to get into it all. Um, the, the question people wrestle with, is this a once and for all kind of uh, proclamation, or is he dealing with a very specific situation? Well, um, scholar Ben Witherington would point this out, and uh, I can include a video maybe online about this, but uh, he tends to go along the lines is that Paul is addressing a situation in this church most likely what was happening is that um, women that were coming to faith to be Christians, they were coming from other pagan um, religions that where they would be serving as priestesses in these temples, right? And so they were coming into the church, and then they were trying to just think they could just start teaching right away. And Paul said, no, don't, you can't do this. Um, you first have to learn before you can teach, right? And, and so that's what Ben Witherington points out in some of his studies is that he's addressing this situation that's going on. Also, in another place, he's addressing a situation where women were interrupting and disrupting the service. And Paul says, listen, don't do that. You know, be quiet. And then afterwards, you can ask your husband or whatever the questions you might have. And so just be careful that we're trying to understand what is going on because actually other places Paul talks about women prophesying and things like that, right? And so it's not like it wasn't allowed, right? We see it. We, we see it was one of the gifts going on. Um, and we also see in the early church women serving as a, uh, as a, as a, a leaders in advancing the church. And so I just say when you read something, be very careful to delve into it a little deeper. If it seems off or weird, okay, what is really going on here? Is Paul addressing a very specific situation that is arising in a church? Um, but anyways, that's what most scholars will say, is there's something going on very in this church where women, where the women are causing distractions, um, whether it's culturally or just practical things and interrupting or whatever it might be. Um, and also remember, too, it's hard because we see things through our lens of society, but this was a patriarchal society, and um, there were some distractions going on. I just don't have time to get into it, but just if, if you read it on your own, that way it will give you a little bit maybe of um, details to understand what's happening here in terms of that. Um, now there's some who don't agree with that either. There's some who think, no, this is a once and for all you know, proclamation. Um, but that's, again, different conversation, discussion on what's going on. But just a little side note. Okay, chapter 3, we see talking about overseers and deacons. Um, qualifi- qualifications and things for overseers and deacons. Uh, overseers often would oversee like a region. You know, some people in modern times might even call this like a bishop or something, you know, where they kind of have an area of churches or people they would kind of oversee. Uh, deacons, uh, really biblically, um, the word is like actually meaning more like a table servant kind of a thing. Um, while we traditionally, many, many churches have taken this to be like a, a power thing, right? I'm, I am a deacon, you know, I'm a, the, to be esteemed and whatever it might be. The, really, the role is like a servant. You're just trying to serve and, and do the best you can to help advance the God's kingdom, right? Having this mindset. Um, 
uh, in this in this chapter three, there's a whole long list of things. You, we'll, you can bring it up. We won't read it all. It's one through thirteen. Uh, essentially, though, it's talking about if you're going to serve, you know, there's some requirements and things to be in these positions. Um, be people who are, are faithful Christ followers, who who um, uh, are are orderly in their lives and things like that. Now. This doesn't mean that you're perfect, because if you look for someone that was perfect, then you'd never have any overseer or deacon, because none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes and whatever. But I'm just trying to do a broad overview in terms of, okay, um, when you are looking at church leadership, uh, you want to get people who are spiritually mature. You don't want someone just to fill a position. You don't want someone just to, uh, because they said yes. Uh, you, you don't want someone that... Um, uh, is reluctant in doing it. Uh, you don't want someone that's struggling either. Uh, it may be in their own faith or, or problems or whatever because it, it can be problematic and whatever. It doesn't mean you won't struggle. I mean just depending on the depth of what's going on in their lives. Um, uh, but again, there's a whole bunch of things in here. But again, it doesn't mean that you never have any of these problems or struggles, but just as you try to get someone who wants to faithfully lead and serve and help advance God's kingdom. Um, and so this is a good prescription for some of these things. Now, why does Paul do that? Here's the reason, one of the reasons anyway. Go to verse 14. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So, I mean, okay, and we already know this. Like, you know, within the church, meaning God's people, uh, even in a congregation, we should act Christ-like, you know? It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. You shouldn't be um, gossiping or slandering or putting down each other or tearing down each other or causing dissension or doing immoral things or, or whatever it might be, you know? And sadly, sometimes that happens, and that turns a lot of people off from wanting to go to church or be a Christian. Uh, and it also hinders the advancement of the gospel. And just, just He's just saying, listen, just conduct yourself Christ-like. Be, be a Christ-like person, you know? Uh, if you find yourself doing things that are un-Christ-like in terms of any of these things, the gossiping, the slandering, tearing people down instead of building them up and causing dissension and uh, doing immoral behaviors or dishonest behaviors, whatever it might be, saying, no, it's just, that's all there is to it. It's not rocket science, really, right? Uh, and so that's really important. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's, it holds you back if you have people in a church that are engaging in this, especially you know, leaders. It will hold you back from growing and, and being blessed um, because you have people who are really trying to get um, uh, maybe their own agendas or, or whatever without trying to keep the main thing of what is going to advance the church, what is going to make sure I am being Christ-like in my behavior, in my talk, in my mind and heart kind of a thing. But that's Paul's reasoning behind this. Um, we don't get into too much anyways. All right, chapter 4, interesting, is now more instructions to Timothy. Uh, and so there's a lot of good stuff in here. Um, we'll just kind of read what Paul is communicating to Timothy here. So verses, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, The Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain food which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourishing or nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teachings that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths or old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and for the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of all those who believe. And just real quick, to, I mean, the idea of people abandoning the faith for um, uh, deceiving spirits or empty teachings. You know, we see a lot of that going on for sure. You know, people abandoning what the gospel truth is about who we are and what God's purpose is for our lives 
and you see, you see people following all kind of stuff, right? About um, things, basically, the Bible says that tickle their ears. People want to hear preachings and teachings that make them feel good about themselves, that tickle their ears, that maybe agree with what they already want to believe. In this case, it seems like it was more about legalistic teachers again that were, you know, telling them, you go, don't do that, don't touch that, don't do that. And Paul's like, you're missing the point of the law anyways. Um, but we see this, right? And so be careful uh, as you listen to preachers and teachings and things like that, uh, that it's gospel-centered. And it's not just things that you already want to hear. People love to hear things that agree with what you already believe, right? Whether it's politics or your faith, or whatever it might be. But when challenged, especially if it challenges us to change, People don't like that, right? And so what this says is, listen, it doesn't matter what you think about something, what does God's Word say about it? It doesn't matter your opinion on something, what does God's Word say about it? And again, we live in a time and place where people don't like that. It's, no, no, it's my view, my rights. Uh, I want to be heard in, 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 in all of this. And people hate the idea that someday they're going to stand before God and God's going to say, I don't care what your opinion on it was. I'm God, you're not. This is what it is, right? And so don't fall into these empty teachings that are out there um, that is not Christ-centered and does not align with what God's Word says here. Uh, and then also it talks about um, training, right? Like, train yourself. He says physical training is good, right? Get into shape and exercise. But even more so, training yourself spiritually, right? Are you training yourself to live godly lives? You know, and that's the thing that we sometimes forget is... Um, you never walk up to a guy who's like super muscular and built <clears throat> and, uh, and say, boy, Doc's like, yeah, me. And you never walk up to a guy who's like super muscular and built and say, boy, how did you get that into shape? And he's like, I don't know. I just woke up this, I just woke up and, uh, I, I, no, he did intentional steps to get that way. He ate a certain way. He trained a certain way. He lived a certain way, right? And so it takes a goal, a vision, intentionality, and action, right? Same way spiritually. You're not going to wake up one day and be super spiritual disciple of Jesus. It takes training and practice and desire to do that, right? doesn't mean that we are so good and holy we do it. We relied on the Holy Spirit, of course. But there are actions we can do to train to live more godly lives in terms of how we spend our time, who we spend it with, um, what do we fill our minds with, what do we do, all of those things. Are we training to live godly lives? It's, it's, it's really that simple, right? Well, we'll just leave it, leave it at that for sure. Uh, and then we'll go on to verse 11. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given to you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. I love that. Here, Paul was telling Timothy, don't let people look down on you because you're young, you know? And sometimes people want to do that. Oh, this young pastor, what does he know? And Paul is saying, Timothy, don't let him do that. No, no. You, you have this calling on your life. Do not let them look down on you because you're young. And he's saying, do what you're called to do. Timothy here probably was in his 30s, most likely. Could be a little younger, but probably in his 30s. Uh, and guess what? Jesus, who we all follow, was in his 30s, you know? And so Paul was saying, Timothy, do not let these people look down on you because you're younger than them. No, no, don't do that. He's saying what? Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, preaching and teaching, right? Don't neglect that gift, he says. For, so for Paul, the main thing he wanted Timothy to do, what? Preaching, teaching, uh, reading of Scripture, which is again in public. And that was the main thing. He said, this is the calling, right? Make sure you're educating people in the Word. Why? To fill what the role of the pastor is biblically, is to equip the saints for the work of God, right? So you come here, you're fed spiritually, and you can go out and do kingdom things, growing in your faith. Uh, that is, I, again, I know the modern Western churches love to tack on all these things they think biblically a pastor is or does, but that is, right, 
Show me in the Bible, show me in Scripture, right? This is the main calling and focus, even for Paul, that the gospel be proclaimed, that the saints be equipped and uplifted to, to do kingdom work, right? That is the primary teaching. So Paul here, again, Timothy, preach the word, teach the word, do it. Don't let people look down on you. Don't let them tear you down. Keep pressing forward, persevere. He says, if you do that, you'll save both yourself and those who are your hearers. And so this is what Paul is saying to Timothy here, um, what's going on. And now go to chapter 5. Uh, we're going to give advice about widows, elders, and slaves. Uh, it's a real quick side note. Remember, um, slavery in the Bible is different than maybe what we think of slavery in terms of um, you know, the, the, the um, uh, slavery we have in mind that happened, which was you know, obviously bad. Uh, slavery often in Scripture was more of an indentured servitude, right, where people, to pay off a debt, would sell themselves into slavery to a person, uh, and often they could buy themselves out of slavery. Also, there was every, um, I think it was seven years or so, all slaves had to be released. Um, there was also, biblically, um, treatment for how Christians should treat these indentured servants who um, had sold themselves to pay off a debt. Oftentimes, slavery um, would also have been a form of social justice because someone couldn't support themselves. They would sell themselves into this, um, this position. And many times they would become a, like a member of the family, right? Many of them wouldn't even want to leave. They, excuse me, they had a practice where, it was a weird practice, but they, to us it's weird anyway, they would uh, um, like go to the, the um, uh, post of the house and put their ear against it and puncture a hole through it into the house, and essentially devoting them to the family for life. You know, it's like, we don't understand the practice, I don't, but that's what they would do, because they would be like part of the family. But nevertheless, just I don't want you to have the word slave throw you off, because many people do, and uh, we don't want to, to, to have that, miss the point of this. Anyway, uh, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 8, anyone who does not provide for the relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied their faith, and is worse than an unbeliever. Verse 17, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well, are worthy of double honor, especially those who work in preaching and teaching. For Scripture says, Do not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. The worker deserves his wages. Verse 19, Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, you, um, you are to reprove before everyone, so that others take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. Um, uh, we'll, we'll go on. Verse 23. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because your stomach and your frequent illnesses. He had a stomach problem. Paul says drink a little wine. Help it. Uh, verse 24. The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those who are not obvious cannot remain uh, hidden forever. So, quick things. There's a lot of real quick hit points in here. Um, the first thing about providing for your family, right, is saying, listen, make sure you provide for your family if you can. If you're able to work and able to provide for your family, do that. If you don't, you're, says, he says you're worse than an unbeliever. He says you have a faith and a duty to provide for your family, right? And then he goes on to talk about um, uh, people working for the church, preaching, teaching, or elders. He's saying they're worth their wages, right? He's saying um, but the old saying about not muzzling an ox while it's, it's uh, doing its work. Essentially, it's saying you know, pay people what, what they're due for their work, right? And so he, there's nothing wrong with um, paying the people for them working and advancing and teaching and preaching and doing the gospel. We actually it's called to do that, he's saying. So don't hinder them. Don't make it hard. Don't make them so they have to work another job if, if they don't have to, right? Try to be able to provide for them. Uh, the worker's is worth his wages is what it says here um, in, in verse 17 through 21. And then in verse 19 talks about um, accusations, saying don't just entertain any wild accusations. If some person comes to you and gives you an accusation or it's a vague accusation or, well, people are saying or, or I've heard, he's like, don't even entertain that unless there's at least three witnesses because people will do that to try to create a smoke screen or try to create like a, a feeling that something's going on, there's a big problem and really there isn't. Um, it's an old tactic and Paul is saying, don't even entertain that nonsense. And he's saying if people are engaging in that, to try to cause problems or if, if, if people are sinning, he says, address it and don't, don't let it continue um, because you can't have this kind of dissension and problem making going on in the church 
it's not going to function well. Uh, and so people that were doing this, he's saying, are sinning, they're sinners. And he says, don't let them engage in that kind of behavior. So there were protocols Paul was putting in place for some things that were, that were going on. Um, and then, of course, lastly here with the sins, basically, he's saying, you're not going to get away with anything. He's like, you know what I mean? Like, um, he says in, uh, where is it, verse uh, 24, he says, the sins of some are obvious, reaching their place of judgment ahead of them. It's coming. Judgment's going to happen. Sins of others trail behind them. Like, it looks like they're getting away with it, but judgment's coming, right? Uh, and then in the same way, good deeds are obvious. When, and, and so there's some that good deeds, right, that you might not even know about that they'll receive the reward for it. So basically, it's like judgment's coming regardless. People will get what is coming uh, in terms of that. And then uh, lastly, okay, lastly, chapter 6. Uh, Paul addresses the love of money, and he's going to have a final charge for Timothy. And so there's some good principles here. We'll go through them very quickly. Uh, verse 3. Uh, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ in the godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is, is a mean to financial gain. Verse 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many uh, griefs. Uh, and so, just real quickly, you know, two things is he says some people they're just they're, the very first part they're just inter interested in controversies and quarreling and dissension and all this stuff uh, quarrels with words. And he's like, don't no, no, don't get into that. Right? There's bigger things and. And people can fight and argue and quarrel about all kinds of things, whether it's you know um, theology, whether it's church practice, whether it's preferences, whether it's whatever it might be. Paul is saying, get rid of that nonsense. There's no place in the church, right? Uh, and then also there are people he says too is the, the, the verse that that uh, gets taken out of context many times. People will often say that money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say that. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. If you, if you find yourself getting so obsessed with money, um, he's saying be careful with that, right? Actually, it's better to find contentment. He's like, we have food and clothes. We can find contentment in that. Be careful because if you find yourself so preoccupied with money and so in love with money for whatever reason, whatever you try to justify it with, he says it can lead you down the wrong place where you have many grieves, actually. Uh, and we'll finish. We'll stop at that. And then go on to final charge to Timothy, verse 11. But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good faith um, of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you were made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And I think we can learn from this, right? What does he tell Timothy to, to pursue? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness, right? And then lastly, verse 17, command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant or to put hope in their wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In the way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in doing so have departed from the faith. Faith, grace be to you all. So there you go. There's a lot in there. I know we, it's a broad overview of Timothy. Hopefully you have a better understanding of what Paul was writing to Timothy. Um, also interesting, you know, thousands of years have passed, but some of the same problem persists in the church today. And Paul is saying, you know, be aware of those. Make sure you are on guard against those. And pursue godless, or godliness. Pursue holiness. Pursue righteousness to love God and to, to love others. Uh, and, and again, 
There's so much in this, and I'm just going to say, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and see what is he saying to you in this? What can you apply to your own life from Paul's message to Timothy in terms of what he's to do and in terms of how a church should function? You know, the church is the body of Christ. There is one God, um, one church, one head of the church, right? Christ Jesus. And so I just encourage us all, let us live in harmony, love, peace, knowing that we're to go out and to live quiet, peaceful lives, to accomplish God's purposes, to God's glory, and have the mindset that Paul did. The worst of sinners, right? A sinner of sinners, I need God's mercy and grace, and we want to go out of these doors that people might see that in us, and that we can see God's mercy and grace at work in our lives as we're called to, what, as a church, build each other up, work together for the advancement of his kingdom, and uh, look forward to that coming day when Christ returns and we'll all sit down at a banquet together and live in harmony, peace, and enjoy the presence of God forever, right? Brothers and sisters in Christ, take Paul's words uh, and, and how can we apply them to our own lives to live a lives that glorify God and function that way. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day and everybody here. God, I thank you for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. God, help us to hear your word, but not just hear it, put it into practice. God, let's be a people who honor you in all that we do, say, and think. Build one another up. Be people whose hallmarks are love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Father, let us live lives out of here to go out and just say, okay, we're thankful for you, Father. We're thankful because you've given us mercy and grace, which we desperately need, every one of us. Let us go out and let people see that working in our lives. And let us take your teaching seriously, Lord. When your word says don't do something, we don't do it, period. When your word says do something, we do it, period. It doesn't matter what we think about it. What does your word say to us? When we do that, we are walking in according to our purpose, blessings, and we'll see the blessings that come from that as we align ourselves with your will and purposes, God. Guide us and lead us, Father. I thank you for everybody here, Father. I thank you for the calling you've given everybody here. I thank you for the church body, Father, that you use us to advance your kingdom. And God, help us to look at our own lives, Father, through your Spirit and see how can we more conform to your image, be more Christ-like in and outside of the church to glorify you. We thank you and praise you in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen.